Gut. You are about to enjoy a Firearms Radio Network podcast. The views and opinions expressed in this podcast are those of the individual co-hosts and do not reflect the official policy or position of the Firearms Radio Network and or their employers. Viewer discretion is advised. This is especially true on live shows. If you like what we're doing and would like to help support the show, visit patreon.com slash afteractionproject. If you'd like to throw us some free support and appreciation, we would greatly appreciate a five-star review on iTunes. Tonight's episode, just like every episode, is brought to you by the Firearms Radio Network. Be sure to check out the other great podcasts on the Firearms Radio Network by visiting firearmsradio.net. This episode is also brought to you by the Range Buddy app. If you guys haven't checked that one out, be sure to, uh, whenever you have a chance, just open up the App Store, download the Range Buddy app on Android or iOS. Um, it's a freemium app, right? So you can access a couple of the drills uh, completely for free, the training log, the, uh, the leaderboard, all that good stuff. And then the virtual instructor um, is, is the coolest part about that app, in my opinion. Uh, we'll talk about that a little bit more throughout the, the show, I'm sure. So uh, head on over, check out the Range Buddy app on Android and iOS. Hey, Jeremy, but, real quick. Uh, yeah. you, were, uh, you were featured, I believe, on Asp, weren't you, recently? Why, Neil Widener? Yeah, Neil Widener, he's, um, you know, he reached out a couple weeks ago and he, he had mentioned that uh, he's getting back into shooting after taking a couple months off. And, um, you know, he, he was looking at the app and he was like, man, it looks like it's going to be a great tool to to help him get um, kind of reacclimated to it. And we were talking about Gabe White's course. He was wanting to run um, a couple of the, uh, the Gabe White standards drills and um, a couple other things just to get tuned up. So that was pretty cool. You were standards uh... drill. Um, I think we got rid of that echo. So yeah, man, that's, that's awesome. I'm looking forward to seeing how he uses that app and, um, how everybody else uses it. We're getting ready to roll out a couple new updates for it to, to improve the UI, um, and some other features and functions. So, um, but yeah, man, it was super cool. Uh, definitely made my heart feel good and was, uh, humbled and honored that he, he's enjoying the app thus far. Uh, but let's get back to what everybody's here for. That's the, uh, the after action project, right? Tonight we're joined by um, John Hearn. Am I saying your name right? Damn it, I didn't ask that in the in the pre-show. That's fine. It's just one syllable. It, okay. It's all easy. It's not Herney or Hurt or anything like that. Just Hearn. John Hearn. Awesome. Uh, Two Pillars Trainer, and we're going to be discussing his cognitive pistol course. Um, so let's let's dive right into it. John, talk to us a little bit about what got you in the firearms training industry, and then we will uh, do a deep dive into your course. Uh, dude, that's a, that's a long story. So I've been a law enforcement officer since 1992. Um, probably what got me the firearm tra training the most is in circa 97. Uh, I was finally getting rid of my revolver as a duty gun. Um, I was supposed to be taking the transition course, which was supposed to be a 24 hour class. That's about three days of training. And I was looking forward to it. Uh, looking forward to it. I was a good shooter. You know, I never shot a 300 on the revolver course, but I was like 295 just chasing it really close, that sort of thing. So I show up for SIG transition course and it's toward the end of the transition class because I was holding on to my revolver. And we go and we like sit in the classroom for a couple of hours. We figure out how to take the guns apart, put them back together. We go out to the range, we shoot a couple of drills and then we shoot the qual. And it's like, oh, you shot, you know, 90%, you're good. And I'm like, where, where's my 24 hours of training to make this happen? And uh, they're like, oh, no, you qualified. You're good. And I was kind of upset, you know, to go from like shooting a 295 ish consistently to like shooting the 270s. I was just horrified. And I'm like, we, we're not doing anything else. And I, and I quickly figured out that not only are we not doing anything else, but there wasn't anybody there that was capable of doing anything else. So it kind of sent me down the path of private sector training. Uh, I actually did my first uh, professional class with Front Sight, um, which some of you may remember was actually started out in Bakersfield, California. So I've made the trip from Las Vegas to Bakersfield and it was, uh, it was a world of difference as far as quality of training. And I've, uh, I've been hooked ever since. What do you feel about the resurgence of revolvers? We were kind of talking about that in the pre-show that there's this revolver resurgence lately. What's your thoughts on it? Uh, I'm a contrarian when it comes there as somebody who carried a revolver as a duty weapon in the Las Vegas metro area in the late nineties when violent crime was really, really kicking. I always thought a revolver was an incredible handicap. Uh, all I can say is my Rigger GP100 uh, never bobbled once. And if you had to beat somebody to death with a weapon, uh, the GP100 would be a top uh, contender for that. So 
Uh, I was very grateful to go to uh, what we laugh at at the single stack world back in the day. Uh, it was just the most incredible change just to not to have to disassemble the gun and reassemble the gun to make it, you know, get more ammunition in it. So uh, I have a contrarian position there. Uh, J frames for certain niches are great. Uh, I might own one or two and an LCR and 22, but it's a specialized tool. I want to do, um, we're going to talk about the cognitive pistol. Before we get into that, I want to kick it over to Matt and Annette and, and would like you each, and we'll start with, uh, with Matt, um, give a brief inter introduction, uh, about yourself, your, your sure. background in the training industry, and then what brought you to John Hearn's cognitive pistol course. Sure. So I've been shooting my whole life. Uh, started out in the field uh, because that was what I was allowed to do, uh, hunt. I never really enjoyed hunting. Uh, I'm not calm. I don't sit still often. So I was not successful at that. But it, it gave me those Saturdays with my grandfather and father. A little bit of range time afterwards. Um, I came up in the era of training was hard to find. So uh, once I started shooting pistol, mid nineties, I turned 21, uh, you know, Southwest Virginia didn't have training. Uh, we have Pat Goodell up in West Virginia. That's not that close. Uh, the war on terror, of course, kicked off a lot of traveling trainers, a lot of local schools. So these past 15 years, uh, I've been trying to catch up. So almost every weekend I'm out doing something, uh, either, student first always uh jdc justified defensive concepts in northern virginia has kind of brought me on so i've been working in an apprenticeship with them uh, for about a year um love coaching appreciate what the guys are doing for me but i'm a student i'm a student first and foremost uh, got into john's class i think i begged my way in pretty much uh i i you know uh john murphy here in culpepper brings a lot of trainers through. So I get to see a lot of different people, including, you know, my local guys. And I saw John was coming through and had no problems getting in his, his, uh, who wins, who loses lecture. Uh, but the shooting portion, I think, uh, I think John called me, I was heading to Richmond to meet some clients on Thursday. John called me and said, Hey, I, I've got an opening. You want the shooting portion? Absolutely. I'm in. So had to rush home, pack gear, head out four o'clock the next morning to go and, and take his lecture. And it, I wasn't disappointed. It was, uh, it was phenomenal. Yeah. We've heard nothing but great things about that. Who wins, who's, who loses. Um, and John, John Hearn in general, right. It's, it's one of these, um, one of these guys that if you're in the, if you're in the industry, you, you've heard it a time or two and it's always in, in a positive light. So. Um, Annette, let's kick it over to you. Talk to us a little bit about your training background and what brought you to the Cognitive Pistol course. Hi, I am Annette Evans of On Her Own. I am a training junkie and a nerd. I've been, uh, I learned how to shoot as an adult because I thought that every girl should learn how to shoot and I never had a chance to as a child. And I have gotten deep into all levels of nerdery around shooting, around defensive shooting, around combatives and everything else. So it it's very natural that I would have ended up in John's class. I've actually taken the lecture portion of it at least twice now. And um, when I had the opportunity to do the, the, the shooting portion of it, I think I might've been one of the first signups. And Annette, I wanna know a little bit more about On Her Own. Tell us about that. Sure, uh, On Her Own is a place where I talk about sort of the, the full spectrum of self-defense and personal safety, primarily for women, but I'd like to think that the things that I talk about are applicable to everybody. So, you know, I love taking classes like John's because it gives me so much deep knowledge that informs the kind of advice that I want to give to the people who follow me. Put myself on mute there. Let's talk about, um, John, let's get into the, the prereqs for the course, the required gear. Uh, let's let's knock that low hanging fruit out of the way. So, you know, the biggest thing to take the course and get get something from it, you have to be able to safely handle your gun um, and have a modicum of marksmanship. Um, you know, almost, you know, an awareness uh, subconsciously of where your muzzle is and uh, where your trigger finger is are prerequisite. Um, I do list shooting recommended shooting prerequisites. I, I, you know, there's a lot of classes you can go and you can get some benefit from. But uh, the recommended standard is to be able to draw from a holster and put five rounds 
into a five inch circle at five yards. Uh, the par is five seconds. It's a pretty standard, you know, drill as far as that goes. Uh, if you can do that, you'll get benefits uh, from the class as far as that goes. Uh, obviously, the the better shooter you are, and the less you have to think about your shooting, the more you will enjoy the class. <laughs> Tell us a little bit enjoy more about that. So, word. what was that? I'm sorry. Enjoy is a strong word at times. <laughs> <laughs> so tell us more about I have John. A great time in the class. Just to be very clear, I I, I I laugh the whole time as people suffer before me. Uh, I'm not sure why you paid me perfectly good money to be abused in that fashion, but myself and my family are deeply appreciative. Your your <laughs> enjoyment was noted. Uh, it was obvious. So you were lethal. <laughs> lethal is a good thing, I guess. Right, and in, in this course. Uh, tell us more about it. Like, what do you, why, w what's all about the cognitive pistol? If you could break it down and just give, kind of sell me as to why somebody should take your course, what would it be? So I think it's fair to, to say that this is the live fire portion of the class that we mentioned the lecture, who wins, who loses and why. And, uh, that lecture is about 10 years now of ongoing research into human performance, uh, through the lens of self-defense. There's a lot of human performance stuff out there. Um, but it's rarely through the eyes of somebody that knows something about the self-defense, using a gun, that sort of a thing. So in very much a real sense, the class is the live fire portion of that material. Uh, in the class, I'm going to sit there and tell you a lot of stuff you should be doing um, to better prepare yourself. And it's stuff that maybe a, a more thorough training environment or a less profit-driven uh, um, training environment would offer you. But we just don't do it. Something as simple as you know, putting people under man-on-man -man shooting pressure, uh, things like that. Uh, so the class is really an attempt to do all the stuff in um, the lecture that I highly recommend outside of the force on force because there's just uh, that's logistically impossible what I'm doing. Uh, overall, the goal is to make you think mm -hmm. with a gun in your hands and along the way work a couple of other skills that we don't re we rarely see on the range. Uh, a great example of a rarely seen skill is shooting moving targets. You know, one of the things that we tend to see repeatedly in real world fights is when bullets start flying, people tend to move, uh, whether it's the, 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 the defender or the person being engaged. Uh, you know, most traditionally, most moving target systems are very expensive and hard to transport, so we simply don't do it. So my class offers the uh, a great building block approach to that using a kind of a training wheel drill, drill from John Holshen, and then moving on to, um, you know, there's a lot of redneck tech in the class. Uh, I don't know how to describe it. Um, it it's it's kind of cobbled together. Um, it definitely needs a paint job to look prettier, but it all works fairly reliably. So, um, you know, I use uh, a variety of uh, mechanisms to make you think with a gun in your hand. It can be something like moving around uh, friendly people with a, with a firearm. It can be I have a series of lights that uh, I've developed at remote control. Um, and what I can basically do is I can contextualize those lights and make you make um, decisions of increasing complexity along the way. And uh, it's just two days of ramping up that complexity, hopefully, you know, having you, you know, improve that along the way so that when we go, for instance, from three lights on the first day to four lights on the next day, it's not a complete and total meltdown. And again, uh, a really big goal is just to do stuff you don't normally do in shooting class. So, for instance, um, we draw and challenge a lot. Um, in the second day, uh, you'll get a visual indicator that it's just time to leave. And we all pay lip service in the training community that, hey, sometimes the best thing to do when violence seems imminent is just to leave. But when do you, you know, if you don't actually train it, you're not likely to do it in the real world. So I guess that would be the uh, slightly more than elevator speech on, on what the class involves. And uh, let, let me just say one more thing. You know, I, I come up with different ways to make you think with the gun in your hand. Uh, another big component of the class is tactical anatomy, which is learning where to put the bullets where they, they, they go best. So we literally have you know, 3D mannequins that you can, you know, for lack of better words, conduct an autopsy on. You know, if you ever wanted to be the, the CSI tech and, and stuff the, the rods through the, the body and see which way the rounds travel, uh, that's a common theme throughout the class. You've got to be, in addition to making good sound shooting decisions, uh, thinking about where the bullets need to go based on where you're standing in relation to the threat is uh, is one of those under kind of those, uh, I guess, those ideas that kind of underlays everything we're doing throughout, throughout the two days. Man, I love it. Um, uh, I know it's going to be a great episode. You're, you're, you're just, you, the way you're talking right now is, is like, man, that is, that's the thing, right? Because you don't, um, we don't see that stuff, right? Like we, we definitely don't talk, everybody's, oh, hey, the, uh, you win a hundred percent of the fights that you avoid. 
and you, you show up to a gun class and there's nothing about that. It's just like, all right, let's blow the whistle, shot timer goes off or whatever you, you draw out, you put a few, put a few rounds in the target and um, maybe you get graded, maybe you don't. Uh, Annette, in the, you know, John was talking about, um, you know, a modicum of marksmanship, I believe is what he said. And, and that kind of elicited a, a response from you. Let's, <laughs> let's talk about that a little bit. What, um, what kind of accuracy and, and marksmanship um, standards uh, were you held to or, or, you know, let's dive into that, that response that you gave us. Man, th this was some of the um, most technically difficult shooting that I see in a defensive pistol class where in most defensive pistol classes, even the ones that start out really, really tight in the beginning, by the end of class, you're just like throwing rounds at the target while you try to absorb everything else. Um, here we were looking at what, when John talks about headshots, he's not talking about a head and sometimes, you know, you even get like a whole, like, you know, oh, we'll do eye box. He, he's looking at like, did you get them in the, are we looking at eyes between the nose, you know, very tight triangle almost, um, reminds me of some of the Dave Spaulding targets I've shot in the past. And similarly, the chest, you know, most of us shoot eight inch circles as chest, right? It's the IDPA down zero zone. Um, we might look at the USPSA A zone, which is a little bit narrower, a little bit taller. John will push that down even smaller. And what I found really fascinating, you know, I laughed at it, but what I found fascinating is how much tighter everybody's shooting got over the course of the weekend because we were held to that standard. It's like people kind of like rose to that level over the course of the week weekend, probably because um, you would look left and look right and feel a little shamed unless you like kind of got your got your shit together. John, in a, in a um, and we're seeing less and less of it now, but in a world where, you know, historically a, a self-defense or defensive shooting course, it gives you the entire USPSA target and, and it's not uncommon to hear, oh, uh, well, you still heard him, you still shot him. Um, talk to us a little bit about the mindset and your, your perspective as an instructor, why the smaller targets, why the higher, higher accuracy standards? I didn't go into my full background, but I actually started out my public safety career in emergency medicine, uh, as far as that goes. Um, so I've treated people, um, that have been shot before. Um, I've worked a lot of trauma patients and stuff like that. Uh, as part of my job, I've attended autopsies. And if you just study the material, uh, you know, I, I had been working on this a long time, but like I went through uh, Dr. Williams had some fame in the early 2000s for his shooting with x-ray vision. There's um, just because we give you an eight inch circle, we do that primarily because it's convenient. And quite frankly, is it's a target that has a modicum of accuracy, but still lets you Ricky Bobby because most people just want to uh, shoot as fast as they can. And the, the higher accuracy standards are almost an impediment. But when you get right down to it, when you look at the important parts of the human anatomy that's going to stop somebody from hurting you or your loved ones in the next 10 to 15 seconds, that's a fairly, I, I don't, I mean, I'll put it this way. I, uh, I have people tell me my targets are too big. Uh, you know, what I hold everybody to is basically an eight and a half by five and a half inch hit zone. It's basically a, a letter uh, sheet folded in half. And if you overlay that with the human chest, there's a lot of good stuff in there. Uh, you know, my friend Jim Higginbotham, who built his targets off a lot of experience in the uh, on the, the sandbox has even tighter accuracy standards as far as that goes. So I wanted an accuracy standard that was reflective of reality without being absolutely soul crushing, I guess would be a, a good way to say it. Um, you know, there's a, there isn't actually four by six box in the, in the middle that I will sometimes hold people to, uh, you know, Annette mentioned Dave Spalding when, you know, when Spalding took the class, he and uh, Bucky with him. And I'm like, congratulations guys. I know who you are. You're, you're held to the four by six box. So there's just, you know, there, there, there is reality. You know, one of the common things we love to do these days is just to ignore reality and pretend it doesn't exist. But when there's somebody at the end of your pistol and you need to stop them right now, that that's reality rearing its head in a pretty ugly fashion. And, uh, you know, one of the things there's a, there's a, so, so first of all, I'm a, I'm a government trainer, so I can't do anything without PowerPoint. That's just who I am. Right. But we'll actually sit there and we'll look at shootings. We'll watch somebody get stabbed in the throat and figure out how long it takes that person to, to bleed out. We'll watch somebody get shot in a, a, a pretty spectacular way where there's just arterial spray going everywhere. And that dude's in the fight for 20 seconds. That's your best case scenario. So, again, um, I think we really have to base our you know, training on reality, 
not um whatever you know it's gonna look really cool on the gram which seems to be driving a lot of people as far as this stuff goes uh you know a full uspsa a, a zone uh lets you play around a lot as far as speed i mean it has had one saving grace which is only six inches wide but uh you know one of the things i mentioned is when you look at the guys that have a lot of experience in this they'll tell you right now that only the top half of the uspsa a zone matters so that's like more realistically that's a you know a 36 inch 36 square inch target uh you know the what i'm during now saying you know that the eight inch circle is about a 50 square inch target i'm asking for 46 square inches so for just a 10 percent demand and increase in accuracy demand uh we get a lot better hits on people and again we're just you know corresponding to reality uh you know it's interesting i didn't know that when i started teaching this class that it would draw a lot of medical professionals right so the highest number because i have a, a cap of 12 the greatest number of doctors i've had in a class was four right hmm. uh three of them in the one class were er docs in the jackson mississippi area who see a gunshot wound or, uh, uh occasionally and it was really interesting we're, we're going through and we're looking at where the bullet would have gone and uh the er doc is sitting here doing like all the math in his head and he finally like you can see a little light bulb coming over his head. he goes you know i never see anybody in the er that's been shot here and i'm like that, that's right doc because they don't make it to you you know as far as that goes so Again, uh, a small ask in the accuracy department, maybe 10% more than what we're asking people, can have huge, uh, very tangible results when we start applying this to the, to the real world. So, I was watching a, just a quick comment. That complexity on those tight accuracy zones just stacks so much when he has you start, sh start shooting off center line. So instead of being on a square range, facing somebody head on, you're shooting from an angle and He's still holding you to that accuracy standard, but now, now the heart chest area is is over on the the pec somewhere, and you've got to figure that out. I'm not holding you to that standard, sir. Reality is holding you to that standard. <laughs> I appreciate you holding me to that standard as well as reality. <laughs> John you know, didn't make the rules. Is, he did no. The the funny thing is, you know, as somebody who came out of the competition shooting world originally is if you look at the A head box in USPSA now, boy, it looks an awful lot like what John was making us shoot. And every good shooter I know in USPSA will tell you, don't use the, well, if you're shooting major, use the entire A zone and probably scatter some in the C. But if you're shooting minor, you are not shooting the entire A zone because you can't afford to slip outside of it. So that makes sense. You know, there's a lot about like this is like the correct anatomical way to do it. But man, if you want to be good at shooting in general, like technically proficient at shooting, you should be able to shoot these targets and you should be able to shoot them under cognitive load. I agree. And then when you look at these USPSA, then you start looking at the letters and trying to trying to focus in on the letters instead of the perf. You know what I mean? Uh, so, John, I want to kind of throw a little wrench in this and kind of sidebar this because I was watching, you know, doing a little bit of diligence today and I was watching um, Unpacking More Police Myths with John Hearn on the Active Self-Protection Extra. And I want to go down the road a little bit of law enforcement um, just because we're talking about accuracy and accuracy standards, right? And we've all heard the stories of standards just getting lower and lower for law enforcement officers because difficulty in getting law enforcement in, difficulty getting them passing. Do you see that changing? Do you think that's ever going to change to where we start gaining um, maybe, I, I guess the best term is like a hunger for law enforcement to be more accurate? Oh, wow. Okay. Um, so that's that's an, that's a really interesting question. Um, the At this point, if we think of this on a scale, the factors that are driving us toward lower and lower standards are so heaped up on the side of mediocrity that I don't see anything in the near term changing that. Um, law enforcement, I mean, if you look around at least a little bit, they are looking for warm bodies at this point. The number of agencies that have like a you know manpower standard for a shift or an area or something like that that are working below that um, is ridiculous. And you know, one of the sad realities is, and I, it's a sad reality and a mixed blessing, is that cops don't have to use deadly force that often. The problem is. When they do, it creates all kinds of drama when it's not done well. You know, um, you know, for every time somebody mentions the the you know as positive as it could be active shooter response in Nashville, uh, dude, there's like 20 mentions of Uvalde as far as that stuff goes. So to go down a philosophical bunny hole, the police have lost the moral authority 
to use violence to keep societal order. And that's what you're seeing. And until that moral authority is returned, or quite frankly, uh, people just get so disgusted with violent crime, um, I don't see that changing in any way. You'll have little pockets. Like, you know, for, for a long time, my friend Lee Weems was a, the chief deputy in Oconee County, Georgia. And they got that department up to a pretty high standard. But as time goes on, new sheriffs are elected, um, you know, training resources wax and wane, new people come and go. Just maintaining a, a decent standard is just becoming more and more difficult. So I wish I had great news there. Um, you know, one of my favorite quotes about Jeff Cooper talked about how the pursuit of excellence is an individual activity and there's always going to be people pursuing that. So I think you're always going to have the cops that you sh that you see in shooting class are not your typical cops. It's uh, I think that's one of the great disservices to a certain way. Everybody thinks when they meet Greg Elifritz at a conference that these are what all the cops are like. And uh, quite frankly, if you were to come up with the opposite of Greg Elifritz, that's what most of your cops are like. So uh, to bunny trail back to that question, dude, you know, until we as a society say that everybody's held to the same standard. And if you step over the line, you can expect these results. Um, nothing's going to change because the societal the societal pressure you know, to, to be better cops is way, way down the road as far as that stuff goes. You've got to get cops returned to proactive law enforcement. You know, police have known for years how to uh, diminish crime. Um, it's just inconvenient uh, for a lot of people. So we're, we're right now we're willing to put up with this. Um, if you follow my business page, I, uh, I, I walk with this utter fascination of somebody watching the world burn, you know, referencing, you know, Chicago, San Francisco and the Pacific Northwest. There's a story every week about how that thing has just fallen apart. So um long story short no i don't see it getting any better anytime soon yeah i'd agree almost like we need it to fail completely so we can rebuild it and then be like hey see this is this is what we were talking about maybe maybe all these things that you guys have been um i forget who said but sometimes violence is the answer you know and it's that's the uh you know here we're in and we're in albuquerque and i'm sure you guys have seen what our our governor recently <laughs> announced right like violent crime is so bad in our city that uh, folks that have gone through a two-day training course, the the second um, longest required concealed carry training in the country, those folks went through a federal background check. Um, they cannot carry their guns because violent crime is so bad in this town. Uh, not to mention the fact that it's there are criminal. I don't know. Um, we well, talked about if, that. If you, give me one second here to rant about Albuquerque. Um, <laughs> You know, you had the consent decree under the federal government that was used for one of the biggest studies. Uh, I think it was Roland Fire, uh, Harvard economist, looked and said that every place a federal consent decree is put in against the police department, crime goes up, murders go up. The Department of the Justice, okay, through that consent decree, not directly, but effectively led to the death of citizens of Albuquerque as far as that goes. Um, years ago, I trained with Pat Rogers. And he had nothing but great things to say about the Albuquerque PD. I think it was your Pete Offender program, very much after the model of the, the LAPD SIS. Those dudes confronted bad guys and took care of the problem. That part of the consent decree was getting rid of that whole unit. You know, that unit no longer exists. So, um, you know, to use the, the Wayne Dobbsism, you know, there is nobody out there looking to pluck weeds from God's garden in Albuquerque at this point. Uh, you know, it's just what it comes down to that. And that was a direct result of, you know, social engineering through that federal consent decree. Yeah. You know, we, we, uh, we have the three strike rule here and it's never been utilized since the time that it was incepted. Uh, and which is a, it's frustrating for us, right? Cause it's like, we literally have the law in the books and no one wants to use it. And now that we have the DOJ in here and all these things, as you mentioned, yeah, indeed it's, it's the problem. And they're having trouble feeling um, law, law enforcement officers here. Uh, my brother-in-law, he had a friend who is a police, who is a police sergeant. She's 16 years in duty here in Albuquerque. And even I talked to her for a while and she was just pretty much gave up. She's like, I'm just here. I just clock in. She's like, people try to race me. I don't care. She's like, as long as they're not pointing a gun at me, I, you know, I just do my shift and I'm out of here. And she said, I used to love this job. And she said, I absolutely hate it. And she goes, the only reason why I'm here is because I'm almost there to retirement. And that's a sad, sad thing to hear from a sergeant, you know, yeah. but uh, I think that's pretty much the way it is. I mean, uh, we've moved. Uh, I don't think anybody decided to do this consciously. They just didn't anticipate all the circumstances is that we are now in a firefighter model. You know, guys are going to go out there. They'll drive around. They'll have blinders on. They will not see a thing. 
And when something comes in, they will drive reluctantly and slowly to the scene, keeping their fingers crossed that the bad guy has left the scene unless they have to do something. And the cops are left, you know, just basically documenting the mess that was left by a violent offender that should have been addressed earlier. Yeah, agree. Got me in rant mode tonight. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> we, we went way was... off the rails, but it was, you know, it was intentional because, you know, we're talking about accuracy and the importance of accuracy in your course. And, you know, if we're not if we're not following accuracy standards and we're trying to get better, then what's the use? And it's just always it's always that question I have for for law enforcement. So as don't to hold when, this to me, but I'm here. just I'm working from memory here. I'm pretty sure that, you know, Albuquerque used to have a very strong, confident PD. Uh, I'm pretty sure they actually got rid of the personally owned weapons with Albuquerque, Albuquerque PD, because I think you guys used to be able to carry whatever you wanted to. And that was just part of that. The consent decree deliberately broke down a culture of shooting excellence. To make sure less bad guys got shot. The, the the desire with that program was primarily, despite what they may tell you, is we want less bad guys shot. How do we make that happen? And it's, now we're dealing with the consequences of that decision. And it's been a, there's been a, um, this tone of anti-police from our government officials, right? We used to have, Albuquerque used to host the, um, the law enforcement cop, I forget what it was, but it was this huge law enforcement shooting competition. It, it um it brought in law enforcement teams from around the world um every year and that was you guys used to host the the nra's uh police ppc match yeah we yep. used to be hosted there it was in my it was a again nerdery it was in uh mississippi for years until katrina wiped everything out then they moved to albuquerque because it was fairly resistant to hurricanes yeah <laughs> too bad it wasn't resistant to uh politicians, politicians. <laughs> So, man, let's get uh, let's get back into this class, man. Um, we're talking about cognitive pistol. Matt, talk to us a little bit about you know that day two, the live fire shooting portion of it. Um, from the student's perspective, what did that look like for you? What were some of the the more challenging drills that you shot? Well, John did a great job of stacking the complexity. So you had seen everything before, but there were gotchas added, and and not gotchas to make you fail, gotchas to make you think. Um, I want to say our, our final iteration, uh, was it called the, the furball? I believe it was called the furball. So you're facing the opposite direction. You're using his light boxes to give you not only a go signal, but what your reaction needs to be, what your target is. You're having to think about all this as the entire class is watching you. I love that stuff. I shoot well under pressure, so not a big deal. Um, he trash talks you some. It, well, he trash talks you viciously. Um, but when you turn and you see your target array, uh, what was it, six, eight targets down there? And they are intermingled. It, it would be what you see if you're the first person in line at, at, a, at a busy McDonald's and shots pop off, pop off behind you. You turn and it's just utter chaos. There's things moving. Your target may have... Uh, may not have a clear background. So you're needing to move to, to make the shot. Uh, you're trying not to muzzle bystanders that don't need to be muzzled. Uh, and you don't know how many threats are out there. So when you saw, I saw somebody solve their problem and whoa, there's a guy in the back, in the back left. That's the overwatch. It, it stacked in complexity pretty well. Uh, you saw people's shooting break down a little bit, which was part of the point is let's find where you can no longer run on autopilot that you need to, you know, the things you need to work on. Fantastic course, extremely labor intensive for John. I, you know, not many instructors want to put something like this on because the target array changeovers were a lot of work. I mean, he had two of my mentors there helping Ashton Ray, Tim Chandler. And I mean, those guys, they don't like to work. They, they want to stand around and coach you. And I mean, John's making them put on work gloves and they're sweaty and they're mad. It was, it was awesome. I loved it. Annette, over to you. What, um, what, one thing that you could really think of in this course that really stuck out to you? Cause I know you've taken quite a few courses. Uh, what's the one thing that John does that really sticks out? The it's the light boxes, I think are like where the, the real magic sauce is because so these lights are used as indicators for what to do, when to do it, sometimes how to do it. 
And then they change around. And then he changes what the lights mean. So it's not just like you can memorize at the beginning of the day. Well, one light is this and two lights is that. And green lights are this and blue lights are that. Like, no, no, they're going to change. And it's just a actually brilliantly simple way to add load. Because it's not just, oh, you have to figure out what to do. It's you have to look for what to do, remember what it was, then actually do it, and then see if there's something else that he's going to make you do before you're clear for that evolution of the exercise. And that's the kind of thing that, you know, like I said, I, I've shot a lot, you know, over the last 10, 15 years, and this is not something I've ever seen before. That level of decision making, that level of cognitive loading that was just changing and changing, and we weren't shooting the same exercise over and over again, so you couldn't just like figure out the game there, there was no figuring out the game and I am like the penultimate gamer and I couldn't figure out how to game this class I want to uh, that might be the nicest thing I've heard <laughs> <laughs> can we I talk game everything I game the casino drill <laughs> normally that's the um that's how you I mean for a lot of once you reach a certain level of skill and proficiency, that's really the only way to to, to reduce, reduce your time, right? Like everybody talks about upgrading their gear and buying skill. And, you know, I think that gets you to the, can get you to the next plateau. Um, but at a certain point, that's you, ha you have a brain, use it, figure out how to game the deal. Um, as an instructor, though, you, you, you find yourself running up against that. And it's how do you get the, the highly skilled, the proficient shooters that are going to gain your drills, how do you get them, um, I guess, back on level footing and even playing ground with the with the rest of this, the, the team or the rest of the, the students? Um, so it sounds like you, you've done a lot of thought, you put a lot of thought and energy into into adding that that cognitive load to to really reduce the ability to, to gain that. Um, John, can we talk about the light boxes? Because we've I've heard a bunch about the light boxes. And I think there's two Johns, right? There's John Hearn, there's John Murphy, there's light boxes, and John Murphy has lasers. Is that the John Murphy I... uses lasers? Yep. And there's also John Holshan, who and uses John. the neuros from uh, Dustin Solomon. So there's literally three Johns working kind of the same territory. Right. So let's. I, mean, I think we... that I've, I've taken Holshan's class, and uh, I, I think our material is very complementary. I think we're working the same field. We just each have our own corner of it as far as that goes. Can we talk about the light boxes? Or is it proprietary? No, no, Nothing can not prepare you for them. <laughs> and so, they move. Don't don't yeah. expect them to be where they were the last time you saw them because <laughs> there was a there was a string where everybody fired and John's like, Matt, do you not have a solution? And I'm like, no, they all fired sympathetically. And the light box is directly behind me. <laughs> but he'll get you. No, nothing prepares you for it. Like I know if I take this class again, if I shoot those drills again, it's going to be the same level of confusion. Yeah. And uh, before we get into the lights, you know, I think what's missing from a lot of classes, and this is this is the classic instructional cop out. Okay, you're here once you've made the decision to shoot. I'm not here to teach you when to shoot. Well, I'm sorry. That's I think that's a bullshit excuse because that press the trigger or not is integral to the shooting solution. Um, so what I was, you know, what I'm trying to do is, you know, we always look at the common metrics of speed and accuracy. Well, I think that discrimination is more important than both of those, but we very rarely measure our ability to discriminate and make rapid decisions in tense, rapidly evolving circumstances. So, you know, the, the light box is uh, just a budding trail here. Um, I've had this idea for a long time and I've kind of struggled to implement it. And I've had friends talk about similar stuff they've done. So it actually started out as a cadence changing drill. I had a plate rack where I'd had uh, plates of different size put on it. And initially it was because I think that it, one of the most important skills you can have is that ability to select your firing solution as far as sights and triggers, but you have to make it on the fly. That's what, what drives me crazy about a lot of shooting classes is they'll tell you you're going to shoot this drill. And you can prep in your mind, well, okay, I'm going to, you know, fire through the body and one to the head and you'll sit there and I'm like, Manette, I'll game and I'll, I'll sit there. And I'll literally think to myself, the cadence, I'll think, tell myself, pop, 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 because that's because I already know what I have to do. I'm just, you know, pre-programming. So the the boxes were a way to take that away from you. Um, and I found it to be very useful. So initially it started out as just a cadence changing exercise. 
and uh the the first ones were were horribly clunky i went to make them bulletproof and i used to have a metal shop in my house so i literally welded this i welded the first box up and i finally picked it up and i realized that it was so heavy as to be utterly useless like this thing must have weighed 40 pounds because i had literally made it bulletproof and uh the second box that i made attached actually it was it was uh i i did trailer wire to connect it to the other box and the other box was wooden and i started playing around with that concept and then um you know i hate giving the chai comp money but um there's a series of uh wireless you know radio frequency controllers you can get online and i started playing around with how they they were set up and i figured out a way to basically let me run initially nine lights independently so basically i have three boxes with three lights on it and i can control any one of the individual lights as i want to or i can turn them all on or i can actually sit there and go turn on two on this one one on that one and three on that one and you know I, I with the the most current version of the class i wanted to ramp this thing up because i knew i was going to have people like annette in the class and my my good friend tim burke so i actually now have a uh, uh a model that's it's basically got four lights on it and that's how i was able to add like the runaway option you know as far as that goes so the boxes have been a very evolutionary concept they were originally like a very hardwired kind of horrible clunky thing uh as i started to travel with it initially they were like in 50 cal ammo cans and I've got them condensed down where they're like, um, well, hold on. Uh, they're like in a 30 cal ammo can. Give me one second. So as he's doing that, we've, we've all seen the range cheater 360 scan where you just go through the motion. These boxes force you to actually process information while you're doing your scan. Um, that meant a lot to me because I've always, you know, why, why am I, you know, why am I going through these motions to scan and there's nothing there to see? there's something there to see in in john's class and uh so i'm in the building this is just like this is the three light model right and the 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 top is black because it's color coded for the remote but basically any of these three lights on and i would turn them on but it would like completely blow off the camera i can just just turn those on individually and more importantly i can contextualize what the lights mean as far as this goes which i think is where the real magic happens so we get really used in the uh excuse the nerdery here using closed motor programs on the range like you're going to draw and fire two rounds to the chest right and you load that and there's really nothing in your environment that's going to change what that response is going to be so what i the lights allow me to do is to at least partially uh bring open motor skills to the range so you know we start out in the most basic iteration one light is a headshot two lights is a uh pair to the body so logically three lights would be like a failure drill but we don't do that we draw and challenge on three lights and just having to have all three of those options on tap and not knowing which one you're going to have front loaded in your brain to perform really, really starts to show the cognitive load, the task load, whatever you want to call it, that a, a more realistic scenario would be in. And we just, you know, we ramp it up from there. I put them literally, you know, I surround the shooters with boxes. Uh, and then also actually uh, one box will mean uh, what I want you to deliver. And the other box is when to deliver it because we just automatically assume that just because I know what I'm going to do, I'm going to do it now. When that's not the real case, I may be waiting for my background to clear, my foreground to clear. The target may not be a threat yet. So, um, you know, you can either think of it as a stupid game with these stupid lights, or you can contextualize what the lights mean to a very, very relevant standard as far as what we need. You know, another example would might be that, you know, one light represents ability, one light represents uh, uh, ability, uh, jeopardy, eminence, you know, the, the three, the, basically the things we're looking for to you know for deadly force and you can't use deadly force to all three of those things are present so again it, it, part of it is you know we have the lights and then the uh the ability to contextualize and tell people what they mean which is where the the real magic happens and, and frankly even without the meanings the meanings almost made it easier in some ways because then i could kind of codify one thing to another one light is a headshot two lights is uh is two to the body three is something else but it just the load of like green light versus blue light, one number of lights, two number of lights. And, you know, John, if you really, really wanted to screw with people, you'd make one light, two to the body, two lights, one to the head, three lights, you know, some other, that kind of thing is so that there's no mnemonic way to remember it because that would make it even harder. You could take this entirely out of context and it would still be a very, very difficult skill that teaches you how to think. You know, I want to play devil's advocate a little bit on this because I'm I'm just kind of listening to the process of the head box, and it, the goal, if I'm if I'm correct, is to get people to think before they shoot, right? Obviously, 
but how do we how do you put that together of like an actual this person is trying to kill me so i have to do a head box or, or shoot him there because he's armored or i'm just trying to put it together to where to where it makes sense in order to use it in a self-defense context does that make sense I think it does. I think we're confusing the purpose of the exercise. So as soon as I try to ground stuff in reality, you've created a scenario and we're not doing scenarios. We are doing a series of drills. And these are drills, which in theory should be very simple um, for shooters, you know, draw and fire a pair to the body at, you know, five yards. That's like one of the, the things that I, I find amusing about this class is everybody starts to whine when we started like, we're only going to shoot at five yards. And people are like, ah, oh, this is the Pasha kind of a thing. And, by the end of the class, there's a lot of people that are really glad that we're not shooting much beyond five yards because, again, I have more reasonable accuracy standards. And if I want to you know, simulate distance, uh, a reasonable size headshot headbox does that. So what I'm doing is I'm letting you practice skills which you should already own. Right. Um, but I'm a, putting a cognitive load or a, probably the more technical term is a task loading on you as far as when to perform the drills. And what most people find is that the drills that they can perform in almost this laboratory antiseptic white coat environment that that in no way reflects what their real world performance is uh Hoshin uses the neuros from dustin solomon that i mentioned and that actually gives you shooter feedback when i did um uh Hoshin's class he asked you at the beginning you know what are your what are your standard draw times and you know i i did that class very short notice i'm in there saturday uh, i've been shooting at work on wednesday and i'd shot a bill for my people i knew that you know from my duty rig I'm pretty good for 125 per shot, seven yards. And the first time I started running the drills with those loads on me, my uh, my cognitive load crept up to or my, my draw time, like got up to 184. Right. And eventually by the end of class, it was back down to 146. So there's a ton of research out there um, that shows us that we get this thing called domain transfer, where if I learn to do something over here, it has direct bearing and transfers. You're not going to get 100% transfer as far as that stuff goes, but that transfer across domains has been very, very, very clearly shown. Uh, I can cite some research on brain training for shooters that that showed that. But you know, the classic example I use is that uh, you know the, the the military unit that we call Delta, when they lost that pool of combat-proof Vietnam veterans, they started working with psychologists to figure out who would make the best operator for Delta. And what they found was that people that engaged in the recreational activities of skydiving, rock climbing, and motorcycle racing had vastly more success in that program. So you're sitting there, what is the relevance? Well, those things aren't directly related, except they make you take utter control of your mind and body and learn to only allow the rational mind to stay in control of the situation. So the course itself relies heavily on this concept of uh, domain transfer as far as that goes and i'm not trying to necessarily create scenarios you do that yourself if you want to contextualize what the lights mean i'm going to give you the lights you can decide whether they're ability opportunity and jeopardy they can be a, a, a threat a background and a foreground but the simple fact is is we pay lip service to making sure our background and foreground is clear but we never actually check our environment for visual cues that that's actually present so that's what I'm, what I'm trying to do uh you know no system is perfect but when you compare it to sitting there and just shooting build drills all weekend, it, I think it's a pretty good step in the right direction. I know Andy's, uh, I have a, I've been working on a system um, and I'm, you know, I got a, it, it's been, I've talked about it a couple of times. We'll, I'll probably pick your brain and talk about it in the, in the after show. Um, but it's kind of, in that same kind of vein or that same line of thinking it's it's how do you right because and that's one of the things i always say is like man it, it, even if you know you have three targets up there and the instructor tells you hey it's going to be x amount of rounds on one of the targets i'll call out a number one two or three the student is still pre-programming that they know how many rounds they have to fire um they know that it's going to be a shoot deal because it's not you know there are no shoot there are no no shoot targets down there um and it's one of those things where it's like, how are we, how is the firearms training industry missing that? Um, I mean, we, we do a spectacular job of just missing that stuff, right? And it's all the other, hey, it's not every problem is a shooting problem, but the vast majority of shooting, the vast majority of defensive shooting courses you take, you're only working on the shooting stuff. And there's, and to your point, there's no, there's no discussion on the, the not shooting or the decision-making process of it. 
And I think a lot, like you said, a lot of instructors will just kind of hide behind the deals. Like, Hey, well, if you made the decision to shoot, we're going to, I'm here to teach you the shooting stuff of it. And it's like, well, that, that's not, that's not necessarily the case, right? Because, you know, the students that are in your class for the first time, or it's the first or the second course that they've taken, they haven't made those, they haven't thought through that line of thinking, right? Like there's, and that's on us, that's on the instructor to kind of bring that full circle and, and provide the, the entire picture. Um, I've heard a ton of stuff about your, um, you know, we've had some, some guests on here and they've, they've mentioned uh, your light boxes. Um, we had Kent Hauer on last week. I don't know if you're, you guys are familiar with him with, with, uh, um, he does a, a pretty, um, thought heavy drill at the end of his class. And, um, you know, you'd mentioned, somebody mentioned the furball drill. I think that was Matt. Yep. Um, talk to us a little bit more about the furball drill if we can. Uh, so you had a. Well, like I said, you're you're facing the other direction, so you're not seeing what the setup is behind you. So having to process that much information, keep the light box information straight in your mind while you're visually searching for a target in a safe manner. Because one thing John, you know, stressed is muzzles don't get pointed at people that don't need to be shot. So even if you think it's a threat uh, that hasn't actually fully developed yet, muzzles muzzles down or muzzles up. Uh, there was a, there was a, a target and this is something on Murphy's range. I forget. It's got a name. I forget what he calls it, but it's basically a cobbled together cart. Um, and again, John making Tim Chandler work way past his physical limits. Uh, he has him tied to this device running back. And if you guys has, have seen Tim Chandler, he is the physical specimen of a range trainer. You know, he is built to teach on the range. He's not meant to run. Uh, so John's got him tied to this device, running back and forth, making this target obscure your possible threat or get in the background of your threat. Uh, you saw people really stress out over this one. I, I don't know if if a lot of people don't get to shoot movers or or it, it, that was such a complicated drill. Uh, yes. I think my hits were pretty bad on that, but I had somebody in the background, so I was not able to shoot good center mass hits or it'd be a pass through and, and hit a target behind. So I'm shooting, you know, high and high and off. And I didn't figure it out in time to get a good hit. I think, I think Tim was part of that though. He's, you know, he's going to be rough on me. Uh, so I didn't, I didn't have a clean shot and I was taking what I had. Um, but you, you saw some people just, kind of kind of spray and pray a little bit on that one it's it was a tough drill and, I, and i'm you know this is after you're tuned up and john's been challenging you for two days and 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 up in that level and up in that level and it just never stops i mean it just kept getting more complex fantastic fantastic two days of shooting and what i'd say about I, the furball drill is it's supposed to be kind of a culmination drill as far as that goes and we're trying to bring together a lot of our concerns but um, in case you guys couldn't tell, I nerd out on this stuff. And, you know, one of the important pieces from the, the lecture that we've done before is this concept of task complexity. And task complexity is used in different ways. Uh, the way I refer to it is it's actually you, you can assign a numeric value from like 0 to 54 on a task that you're trying to accomplish. And in most shooting classes, we have almost zero task complexity in what we're trying to do. You're literally standing on the range, shoot the dude in front of you. And you're told exactly, you know, when to do it as far as that kind of stuff goes. As far as test complexity goes, that's very low and it really doesn't reflect reality. Uh, my goal with the furball drill is to put people, especially armed citizens, in the most complex scenario that they are realistically likely to, fin to, to actually face, which is going to be, you know, everybody wants to be church security until you have to make a Jack Wilson 14 yard headshot on a moving target, right? Um, so kind of the, the, you know, the purpose of the furball is like, hey, what is the most, you know, it's, it's much more of a scenario. What is the most likely task that you're likely to have to solve as an armed citizen? And it's kind of a, a gut check toward the end to make sure to see where your skills are. And some people were able to pull it off and some people aren't. Um, you know, in, in some ways, uh, you know, I, I have a handout that I give everybody to start a class. Half the handout is how, is how to get better because most people show up at that class and kind of like are walking away going, yeah, I could probably, you know, press a trigger 
more gently and align the sights more quickly as far as this stuff goes. So I think it's also a pretty good gut check uh, as far as that drill goes. I do want to say one thing. Um, a lot of classes are, you've already made the decision to shoot. This is how we're going to accomplish it. As someone who's been doing training for not as long as John, but for quite a while, I'm actually really appreciating that classes are getting more honest about that. You know, they are saying this is all, this is where we have placed the problem, which is, you know, after you've decided to shoot. It's just that we don't really have a lot of options to offer people when they go, OK, now that you've taught me how to do the thing after I've decided to do the thing, how do I decide to do it? And then we stick them in a lecture class with, you know, here is the here is your legal right to self-defense. And that's cool. You need to know that you need to be able to articulate that. But this is kind of this type of class is where we can start crossing that bridge of making those making those articulations more in real time. Because even if we're not, you know, having to articulate that particular thing at that particular time, by adding the tax task complexity to what we're doing, we're freeing up so many more cognitive cycles to be able to think about all of that legal stuff that we learned in the lecture class. And we don't have to think about, you know, we can deal with that and we can deal with the problem because we need this sort of like graduation exercise to bring it all together. Hey, that's a, that's a great point. Um, and I think you, you did a, I think you did us all justice by, by kind of explaining that because it, you're right. There's, how do you cover it? If you go to a two day, a two day shooting course, it's, it's two days of shooting. And if it's with a reputable instructor, it's, it's, it's a quality two days, you know, um, Hopefully. <laughs> well, yeah, if you're with a, most of the yeah. reputable, most reputable instructors today, right. It's not like 10 years ago where, you know, you know, 15 years ago when I started doing this thing, I had, Oh my gosh, there were so many, you know, there's guys that hosted TV. There's a guy that hosted it. And I was like, I got to go out there and train with that guy. And then it got really small. And then over the last, I guess, 10 years, the last five years, there's this, there's this crop of instructors, right? John Hearn, John Murphy, AJ Zito, right? All of these guys, you know, Jedi even, um, and I say Jedi even because he's, he's probably on the road more than anybody else and, and reaches more students than anybody else. But he was relatively unknown 10 years ago, I would say. Right. Uh, I don't even know if he was doing it 10 years ago. Um, so there's this, this group of this great group. It's the golden age of, of training, I think. Uh, but it's, how do you fit that in? Um, and I guess it's reassuring that, you know, John Hearn is so, um, well-known and, and respected within the training industry that um, he's able to go out there and, and do these classes on a regular basis uh, because it is something, it is a bridge that we have to cross and it'll be interesting to see how that plays out. And it'll be interesting to see of the folks that have trained with John Hearn and go on and become instructors, how they implement a similar process into their teaching style so that they can continue to kind of convey and disseminate this, this information and training. Um, you know, we were talking about, you know, the decision making process. Um, and I'm going to use that as a shameless way to, to segue into the Range Buddy app uh, because it's been a pursuit of mine, this this randomness thing. Right. And it's, you know, gunfights are random. Your training should have some element of randomness to it. Right. Um, and in that virtual instructor, the virtual instructor component of that, you can enable shoot or no shoot images and the the amount of time you want it to, to display and you set it at a quarter of a second, you know, a half a second or whatever, and it will randomly choose a shoot or no shoot image um, along with the um, the command that it gives you. Uh, and it's not always, it, you know, it's you can enable the different colors. So red, yellow, green, blue, purple numbers, shapes. Um, and it, so it's for me, it's one of these things where, you know, I think it's a very useful app, but it's something that I selfishly created for myself. Um, that I can get out there and add some randomness to my training. Years ago, we were out on the range and um, what I did is I, you know, the redneck t technology deal is I just got on and I recorded different colors, shapes, and numbers. And I put them on a, on an Apple playlist and I would hit shuffle. So it would give me a random command that way. Um, and I was like, man, there's gotta be a better way to do this. And then I was like, what else can we do? Um, you know, we talk about shooting, shoot or no shoot decision-making and how can we increase our 
you know, the, the amount of, or decrease the amount of time it takes us to, to see something and make the decision. Um, so that's, you know, the shameless plug for the range buddy app. It's, it's, I think it's awesome. Um, and it will hopefully tie in with this other big project that I'm working on in the future. Just waiting on the government to get on. There. I just can't help but think, you know, you, range buddy sounds so helpful. So, you know, my only <laughs> comment is if you've got the range buddy app, I must be like the range asshole. It must be the must be the equivalent class on my side because I'm not anywhere nearly as nice as you. <laughs> Man, did so I, mean did that I, he had to top off. <laughs> oh, I'm so glad I did not kill the, the 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 thing. Sorry about that. I don't. I my mouse clicked and dragged and kicked me out. <laughs> All right. So everybody's still everybody's here here with us. Sorry about that, John. You were here. No worries. Um, you were talking. About one piece that I actually thought was really helpful, um, John, when you're giving us some exercises for how, how do we how do we train this on our own when we don't have something helpful like the Range Buddy app? And you gave us this um, series of variations on the casino drill that uh, you can't plan around it, right? You can't game these variations, especially once you start throwing in the dice. And I think that was really helpful too, is, you know, there are simple ways to do this as well as complicated ways to do this. It's sort of whatever you want to do that day. And while it would be cool if, you know, every couple of weeks I could go shoot with John and he could, you know, flash lights at me and I could be really confused and think about Star Trek references the whole time. Uh, there's, there's, I told you I was a nerd. There's other ways to practice it. And, you know, I, I, I would love to see the app, Jeremy. I haven't had a chance to look at that yet. But also some of these, like, use some dice with numbered targets or throw some dummy rounds in or throw a little movement in, you know, whatever you're doing to add that complexity and having that guidance in the class of seeing that it doesn't have to be a certain way of adding complexity. You can add it in all sorts of different ways. And that's what I think is important to recognize is the whole concept of domain transfer is that by doing a, no, none of us have the perfect solutions. So the best way to do it is to do something of this, something from this, something from this, something from this, and just have faith in that psychological process of the domain transfer uh, to make it happen. Uh, one thing I wanted to chime in just to, to be clear, because uh, just so the listeners aren't confused, is there's actually two versions of the class. What we're referencing is the two-day version of the class. Uh, I've been offering primarily the one-day version as far as that goes. Uh, this is actually only the second offering of the two-day class ever. So uh, there's still a bit of a little guinea picking going on. So just to be clear, there is a one-day version and a two-day version. Uh, the the one-day version covers almost like an introduction to the material, but like there isn't there isn't time for the fur ball or moving targets or anything like that. So in my mind, the real value is the two-day because we don't you know we spend a lot of the the first day making sure everybody's safe, getting you the information, the psychology background and stuff like that. And it frees up the whole second day to really, really work it. It's a much higher round count class than just simply the, the first day twice. Um, and, and a big component, as Anna touched on, is like, how do I practice this stuff on my own? Because some of the drills we already own have great value, like the, the Farnham DTI dance, the variations, the 3M drill that Tom did with that. That also has huge benefit as far as making sure these um, these skills are actually uh, wired into our brains in a way that's actually useful under stress. What's the round count, John, for this two-day course? Uh, I think we got we were between six and seven hundred. Is it no? I, don't, I have no idea. Uh, I could I couldn't uh, keep keep count. Um, the, the trunk of my car is just filled with ammo and three different calibers <laughs> right now, so I have no <laughs> idea. So I would say this: the the two-day version of the class is pretty much a two hundred round class with some wiggle room up to 50. Uh, I went around as we were going through the drills and I'm like, hey man, how much ammo do you have? Because I recommend 600 with a max of 700. And people are like, dude, I brought a whole case of ammo. Let, you know, that kind of a thing. And again, we're not just shooting, you know, my my uh, one of my role models was Louis Auerbuck. He says, uh, one of his lines from the class I'll never get is like, we're not going to sit here and shovel shit into the berm, right? You know, we, we shot a lot, but they were all high quality rounds as far as that goes. So I think that Absolutely. we ended up somewhere between six and 700 rounds for the two day course with uh, the, the majority weighted into the second day uh, once we got rid of the, uh, once we got past the academic portions of the course. And uh, I'll, I'll just say this, you know, people go academic, oh my God, that's horrible. Um, I know this material can be really dry and I do my best to keep it um, entertaining and lighthearted, uh, if not, you know, amusing. You know, I have friends that say, you're not amusing. 
But, you know, even the lecture that we've mentioned earlier, uh, it runs about eight and a half hours, but people are always coming. It's like, dude, I can't believe that that, that time just flew by. So I realize this is something that could be a very painful death by PowerPoint, but I do my absolute best uh, to make sure that doesn't happen, to certainly minimize that. And um, most people are laughing and grinning throughout the whole process. I know I am. <laughs> Honestly, if I hadn't had the lecture before the two-day class, I would have missed something. I might not have known that I missed something, but that lecture tied in perfectly with, with the two days of shooting. The other you know, going thing back the, I was going to say, the other thing with the multiple days is, and you mentioned this a little bit mm -hmm. on day two of the shooting, is getting that sleep cycle in. Mm -hmm. So I've seen who wins, who loses, like I said, at least twice. And it's because I've been able to listen to it, think about it, listen to it again, think about it, sleep on it, that the shooting days were much more doable because it was a review of material and it was a contextualizing of the material more so than, oh my gosh, I got all this new stuff. And similarly, some of the stuff that we shoot on day one, after you, you at the end of day one, you're fried. You go to sleep, you get back up in the morning and you know, this is the way the brain works. Everything kind of integrates. Hopefully you got more than, you know, three or four or five hours of sleep and it all clicks together. Day two, suddenly like things fall together. So that's the other reason I think it's really valuable sometimes to take these two day classes. I know they're a slog. I know they're hard to get to and get through, but there's a certain amount of learning that takes place over two days that you're just not going to get in these one day classes. It never seems like there's enough time, right? Yeah, there's, but there is something, you know, there, like you said, there's very good hard science for this. Like, you know, one of my goals and we didn't quite get it. So we got hit by a thunderstorm is but like pretty much anything we do on the second day. We've covered it earlier in the first day. So like we do a block on moving targets. Right. So that ideally we do the block on the moving targets in a more basic way on the first day. And then you get a sleep cycle on that, which actually allows all that, you know, that, you know, the, that memory to consolidate a lot more, having a lot more likelihood of that. So when you come in the second day, I was actually kind of pleasantly surprised is that people really tuned up with just a night of sleep. So I saw how they were shooting when they left on the first day, but mm -hmm. when we went back and we did, you know, slightly different variations on the drills, the class did much better than I would have predicted based on the first day. Let's just put it that way. <laughs> they were so I bring up day one. So I bring up the, uh, I bring up the round count pretty often because, you know, being here in Albuquerque, we only have really, well, we have good trainers here, but we only have one good one. We always mentioned him, uh, Heron, but I travel quite often for courses and it's like, what's the round count? And I can't remember the course I took and it was a thousand rounds. I got there, flew, went through two days and I think we only did 500 rounds. So then here I am because I shipped it. And then it's like, okay, how am I going to get this back home? You know, literally I'm at the airport weighing my bag, throwing well, these jeans I don't need. Up, oh, these boots are old. You know, what can I throw away? Because I'm not throwing away ammo, right? So I always wonder, you know, to get an idea of a round count. But I like that to be able to walk around. And maybe next time I'll go up to the instructor and say, listen, I brought a thousand rounds. I intend to shoot just about all of it somehow. Even if you just leave me alone on a berm somewhere. I don't know. But uh, I think that's important. But um, John, I was going to ask you on your two pillars. Is that a name that you created and what, what the background is on that? I was trying to come up with a name that reflected what I was trying to do. And I've had some great mentors that got me here. You know, I, I've been associated with, with Tom Given since 2001. Uh, I think I did the second open enrollment class that Craig Douglas ever did. And I remember get, one of the things Craig said is that you got to be really careful. And I heard Murphy say the same thing. You got to be really careful when you pick your company's name, because if you do start to get some momentum, you're stuck with what you got, right? So I thought long and hard. I mean, there's I don't can't tell you how many elite ninja tactical gunfighter shooting training plat, you know, instructors there are as far as that goes. But what I was trying to do is come up with a concept that reflected what I was trying to do. And the, the two pillars are um, peer reviewed scientific research and real world best practices. And that's what I was trying to do was that a lot of times the real world best practices are based in and we now know good peer-reviewed scientific research we can point to the literature uh certain works and stuff like that and see you know we've always kind of to a large degree i'd say we knew what to do you know uh the bunny trail here i always was fascinated by jeff cooper because jeff cooper figured out what to do 
way before we had the psychology to explain it. Now, in hindsight, we can sit here and, and go, yeah, okay, that's a reflection of task complexity. That's a reflection of novelty. That's why this works so well. So what I'm trying to do is basically do, um, I, I don't know if you call it, do all the heavy lifting for everybody. You know, not everybody has access to a university library, can work their way through the peer-reviewed literature, find out where the good stuff is. You know, I've been blessed and because I still have a government email. I can get some um, some of the authors to talk to me and stuff like that. So I like to think that I do a really good job of, I guess I could call it practical nerdery, right? <laughs> you know, um, how do we take the stuff that was developed in the labs uh, that we know to be true and make sure that we can apply it in the real world? So that, you know, again, that was what the whole idea of Two Colors was. Is it's like, well, what are you doing? Or, and it's like, you know, you know, Range Master is an excellent collection of real world best practices. What is What has actually worked in real world fights? And then, you know, looking over at the literature as well and getting these important concepts, whether it's recency or task complexity, debunking the heart rate myth, all that kind of stuff uh, has been a, a goal of mine. And just trying to do it in a coherent, integrated fashion that is mostly entertaining along the way. I think one thing that spoke to John's character to me was, you know, he took the time to credit every source he covered in his lecture and the class portion. Um, you know, our history is important. We we love this stuff. As Annette said, as John's, you know, we're all kind of, we nerd out on this stuff. John's intellectual. Um, the things that he brings to the table are fantastic, but he also mentions the history, where it came from and who developed it, whether they were right or wrong. He still gives them credit. And, I, and that spoke to me as as very solid, educated on on this stuff. Man, I remember the uh, the heart rate myth, right? And everybody was uh, just we we missed the um, you know what induced that heart rate, and it was it was kind of cool to see. Um, I I hate asking this question, um, but we've gotten some good stuff out of it. John, is there anything that we should have talked about that we we haven't already discussed? And I ask that because I don't want to I don't want to do the the course a disservice by you know, I think the conversation went a, a bunch of great ways this evening. Um, but with my scatterbrain, you know, if I'm on your side of the deal, I would I would likely forget something that that I think is really important. So is there anything like that that we missed that we should have mentioned or discussed that we haven't got two to? Things, two things that kind of coincide with what Matt said is that, number one, uh, this is not necessarily an easy course to put on. Um, you know, when I sat here and I you know tried to figure out the pricing because, like, I'm, you know, still an unknown to a large degree and stuff like that. Is I'm like, can I charge for the class what it's going to put me, cost to put me on it? And I'm glad I made that decision to go. Yeah, this is what this is what the class costs. And quite frankly, I've had several people tell me it should be more. So you yes. know, most people don't appreciate the logistical load of what's involved to get the experience, for lack of a better word. There's like six turning targets, four 3D anatomically correct targets, a good set of steel, a mover, and a bunch of other target stands. Plus, you know all the electronic stuff. So I, you know, I've been through Paul Howe's instructor class. And one of the things he said is that if you're going to basically, if you're going to rely on oral and verbal communication to, to get what you need done, you need to have a PA system. So there's no doubt that people heard you. So I travel with a, uh, you know, my own PA system. Uh, I literally have it. I bought my, my personal vehicle is an, is an F-150 and it literally was bought to haul all this stuff. So uh, I would point out that like, you know, there's a, there's this huge amount of value in the class from the standpoint of you get to shoot stuff. You're not going to typically get to shoot as far as classes like that goes. So I would say there's that. And the other thing is just um, we, we've touched on it is you really need to hear the lecture to understand what we're trying to do. The class is fine as a standalone. But like, for instance, the, you know, the class, the way I release this is like, you know, I have a, uh, a, a mail notification for Eventbrite for my stuff. I very quietly leaked out to places that I knew people that would be good shooters and we get this that I was flying the course and I was trying to target people who had already had the lecture. So that was half the seats and the other seats were pretty much required to buy the lecture. Yeah. Buy the lecture. And you know, you couldn't separate them. I mean, I guess you could buy the lecture and just not show up if you wanted to. But again, um, I've done a lot of the heavy lifting as far as the research and making this thing, you know, practical as far as, you know, takeaways, do this, don't do that kind of stuff. So uh, again, it's a, it's quite the dog and pony show. Uh, people will hang around just to figure out how I'm getting all this stuff back in the truck. And they were absolutely amazed that it all fits in there. It's, it's kind of like, you know, the clowns coming out of a Volkswagen kind of a trick. And again, 
you know, take the lecture. I swear it, it's not as painful as it sounds, I guess. It, it is super interesting. Um, so what I used to tell people about uh, William April's lecture is if you're a true crime fan, you would really enjoy this. And I feel like if you're any kind of nerd about like how to learn things or again, true crime, like this is super interesting stuff. Like this is the stuff that the true crime podcast doesn't really dig into that it should. And like suddenly gives you a new appreciation for it. And the other thing is, so I've done a, a, a lot of training over the years. I just looked at my training log and I'm, I don't want to think about how much tuition is involved in those 1500 hours. <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, but here, here's the thing. This class does what very, very few other classes do. Like I have a list that I keep of, Hey, if you're getting started in this world, like here's the progression and you know, the more money you have the further along, these are the things you do. This is a class that's on that list. Now, yeah, like learn how to shoot your pistol, go take mag 20 lecture, one of the other good quality legal classes, go take this so you can put everything together in the chaos that is shooting people in the real world. And it'll help you in other pursuits too. So, you, you know, like, again, I'm from the gamer world. Gaming is a giant task load and cognitive exercise. You know, being able to do the stuff that you can, learning the stuff that you need to learn in this class is applicable. Again, domain transfer all around anything that if you're interested in shooting guns well. I was going to ask where you thought this class um, should fall on a student's continuum of training. I, I would put it, I, I think that once you have the marksmanship ability and the gun running ability, you can benefit from, benefit from the class. But where I think you'll get the most benefit from the class is you've gotten that shooting ability, that gun running ability, and you have some sense of the legal context in which you're playing. And not something to not mean to rehash, but we talked about this in our previous podcast to where, you know, I'm a competitive shooter, kind of, you know, I, I like the self-defense world. I just like to shoot generally. And I like to compete when I have time. Cause Jeremy keeps me on the range, like, you know, three weekends a month and stuff. But uh, anyway, I, uh, we were talking about this last week on our podcast about, I feel like I've done a lot of competition driven kind of courses lately. <laughs> and a lot of shooting drill courses lately. And this sounds like really something down my avenue to where you, I'm start getting to get the cognitive processes and the more thinking of the, of, of the shooting and the self-defense driven of like why we're doing things. So I'm really, really excited about this. And uh, you definitely got my ear, John. I'm going to have to find out where you're going to be. So my next question is that indeed, when are you going to teach this course next and uh, where can we find you? So uh, I have a website, twopillarstraining.com. Uh, the website is still very crude. I need to get it updated as far as that goes. Uh, you can find the course listings on Eventbrite, uh, jhern.eventbrite.com. Um, right now, I've only got, I actually am, in, I'm at Mead Hall in October. Uh, there's one class or one slot left in that class for the two-day version of this class. Then I'm in Camden, Tennessee for November. I'm, I'm taking, teaching the lecture on Friday. And then I'm actually going to run the one day version of the class uh, twice, basically once Saturday, once Sunday, as far as that goes. And then I don't have I have got a lot of tentatives for my 2024 calendar, like I'm pretty much booked, but I'm finalizing stuff. So if I had to guess and this is an official like, you know, Carl's KR training in January, uh, probably lectures out in Utah in February. Um, TACCON is April. So I'm working my way around uh, as far as that goes. Uh, so I should have that 24 schedule finalized very, very soon. But if you if you want to get the material right now, there is literally one slot left at the uh, the Meat Hall class in October, uh, early October, as far as that goes. And I'll have the Meat Hall is... schedule out soon. Sorry, I get so excited about Meat Hall because it's probably one of the most beautiful facilities I've ever seen to train on. I've heard so... that more than once, too, that Meat Hall is just an amazing place. So, you know, you could get two, four there, you can get a great class and you can have one of the best ranges to train out I've ever seen with the best bathrooms. <laughs> That's important. <laughs> all right, man. Uh, I know we got a couple of East Coast guests with us this evening, so I'd like to give you all the, the rest of your night back. Um, really do appreciate you jumping on. I think it was a great conversation. Um, 
man, you, you hit a lot, of, a lot of points that pull at my kind of heartstrings and just get my brain buzzing. Uh, I'm a sucker for the lecture stuff. Um, you know, if I can find a class with a, with a great lecture portion of it, you know, I, I'm 100% okay spending eight or 10 hours in a classroom. Um, just, I think that's where me personally, I think there's more knowledge transferred in the classroom setting than there is, uh, out there on a the range. Um, Andy, you had some. Yeah, I want to throw this out too. just kind of popped in my head um, again, referring to just kind of doing my diligence, listening to John Hurd podcasts today. And, you know, we lost William April here a few years ago and there was nobody that could ever seem like, well, I, I feel like there was nobody that could replace him in his education. But John, I think you're up there with the type of information that you're giving and you're sharing. And um, I think somebody needs to fill that slot for even more so on these seminars that you're doing. And I just kind of want to throw that out there because it's important. We we lost a huge asset in William, unfortunately, and someone needs to fill that slot. So, um, you know, uh, I'm going to nominate you. Just saying. I'm doing my best. And to be fair, uh, um, William and April and I have been tight for years. He was one of my groomsmen when I got married back in 2008. We've known each other since Thunder Ranch was still in Texas. We shared a cabin um, out there one week and we got it's a it's a story that's not fit to the air as far as how we got introduced but you know william and i were tight for a long time so i would say this is that i have addressed similar topics that william taught i just look at it from more of a nerdy perspective i have an, a, a class called defeating violent actors a conceptual and tactical approach where the first half of the class is all the academic um, material you know what is crime doing in the u.s what are our types of criminals all that kind of stuff what are our strategies to, to avoid them and then we actually used two historical police gunfights, the uh, the Mead Hall, I'm sorry, the Mead Hall, the New Hall Massacre from 1970, and then the FBI Miami firefight from 1986. We use those as case studies of what, what happens in our worst case scenario where we get a sociopath uh, combined with a psychopath and what kind of havoc they can reach, wreak, and what we have to do to prepare for that. So uh, uh, I'm not here to uh, replace William. I'm here to compliment what he did. Um, and yeah, he's, he's left a, his, his death left a huge, huge void in the training community for sure. Yeah. Um, I was fortunate enough to take his unthinkable seminar a couple times. Um, great man and a, a Titan in the industry and, you know, so it's cool to see, man, that I might have to spend like a, you know, Sounds like you're taking up a good block of my 2024 training budget and 2025 even. Uh, both of those classes sound like something I want to do. Um, cool. I'm terrible at the uh, at this whole podcast thing, so I'm I'm super appreciative of the the insight and the the expertise, the knowledge that y'all shared with us and our listeners this evening. Um, thank you so much for joining us and giving us your time. Uh, for our listeners out there, remember, it's your life, it's your safety and protection, it's your responsibility. We'll see y'all tomorrow.